It's my very great pleasure to be welcoming uh, Sir Laurie Magnus, who is with us this evening. The Culture Prosperity Program comprises uh, three broad categories. There's the history of capitalism, of course, a groundbreaking uh, initiative now in its second year. There's the Architecture Prosperity, which uh, looks at the impact of the built environment on the human mind and its means of creativity. And then there's Roads to Freedom, under which banner uh, we are sailing this particular mm -hmm. evening. Uh, Roads of Freedom looks at various obstacles that have arisen to the exercise of human freedom in recent years and decades, and the means by which those obstacles may perhaps be removed. And historic England has much to offer, of course, in the narrative of freedom. Uh, the historic nature of England is one of its more remarkable attributes, and those who live in England, who may not always be English in nationality, are surely right to be uh, struck by the depth and longevity of English institutions, whether it's church or parliament or crown. And these things live for us in the fabric of our heritage. These matters are going to be the subject of Laurie's address to us this evening. He brings uh, a keen eye and a discriminating mind to these matters of the heritage of the English and the means by which they may be uh, fashioned anew for our times. Heritage as a cultural asset, the way by which it may now once more uh, live again among us is going to be the theme of his talk to us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you uh, Sir Lauren Magnus. And one thing I'm enjoying to say to all of you is that there's a, there's a thing about Twitter that I've got to read out. Um, and you can Twitter this evening at Legatum Inst, and you can have a hashtag as well with one of those hash signs uh, at Heritage. So if you feel uh, uh, happy to do that, then do just you know, join in as Laurie talks to us about Heritage as an asset. Great. <coughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, it's very nice to be here. I think the word how is actually tweet. To tweet. Yeah. <laughs> to tweet. To tweet or not to tweet, that is the question. Anyway, it's very, very good to be here. Um, I want to, my, the title of my talk is Heritage as a National Asset. Um, and you'll see why I um, have that title as I go into this. Now, just imagine a world where history was outlawed. A world where Henry Ford's maxim, history is bunk, formed the introductory paragraph to our written constitution. Just imagine that world where the logic for this Philistine vandalism was justified in the words of Herman Kahn. Everything we create is eventually garbage. So all we have in the world is a huge garbage-making machine. Just imagine that world, a law saying any building of more than 30 years in age should be demolished without mercy. Structural cleansing, you might call it, a mantra of faith, what J.B. Priestley called the evil principle, the evil principle which haunts planners and surveyors, is hard at work amongst us. It would involve the removal of Anything old, all archaeological remains, all ruins, all ancient buildings, all records. There will be no argument about the Palace of Westminster, huge cost as it is, just pull it down. There will be no churches or mosques or temples, just modern manifestations. The Romans did it in Tunisia to old Carthage and so-called Islamic State is doing it to Palmyra, which is an absolute tragedy. And they will, no doubt, do the same in Libya if they take over Leptis Magna. Now, <coughs> it might not all be bad. After all, Canary Wharf inspires some, but under this rule it would shortly be demolished because it's getting to being 30 years old. Now, Kenneth Clark, he of civilization fame, not the uh, more recent politician, 
uh, had a good repost to structural cleansing when he addressed the annual general meeting of the National Trust in 1970. And I've slightly altered this. Uh, the world of great homes and peaceful village streets and decent market towns once seemed absolutely inviolable. Now it has largely vanished and is continuing to vanish at an incredible speed. But a great part of us, our laws, our language, our lyric poetry, belongs to that world. What a misjudgment if these parts of our life were, were, were without visible confirmation. The built heritage not only provides a great pleasure, and pleasure isn't to be sneered at, it also plays an important part in stabilizing and unifying our society. Now my aim in this lecture is to make the case for the built heritage, why it matters, why it has an economic value, but also why it matters beyond economics, providing a sense of well-being and happiness and a sense of local, regional, and national identity. So just to talk about what I mean about uh, the built uh, heritage. Now, we at Historic England maintain the National Heritage List for England. And that is a register of all the listed buildings in England, roughly 10,000 Grade 1 listed buildings, roughly 20,000 Grade 2 star buildings, <coughs> and the balance, roughly 355,000, are Grade 2 listed. There in, in, in addition to that, there are 20,000 scheduled monuments, 49 <coughs> registered shipwrecks, 1,640 parks and gardens, 45 registered battlefields, and something in the order of about 10,000 conservation areas. There are also 18 World Heritage Sites in England. But that's just what we list on our National Heritage List for England. There are also uh, a large number of properties which are listed locally by local authorities. Many historic properties aren't listed, although 20% of residential dwellings in this country were built before 1919. And in the parlance, I mean, I've talked about structural cleansing, eliminating anything uh, which was more than 30 years old, but in the parlance, historic is often applied, the word historic is often applied to any building which is more than 30 years old, <coughs> which is why at Historic England we often get involved in listing uh, modern buildings like the Lloyds Building and uh, the, the, the Skate Park at Romford. And 99.2% of the population, would you believe, live within a mile of a listed building. So the historic environment, and I should just make this point, is absolutely distinct from the natural heritage, which is an absolutely uh, further part of our heritage. And I will occasionally um, blend the two together, because obviously they do go together very much. Now, at the most basic level, the historic environment, the impact that men and women have left on our landscape from the first prehistoric settlement to 1970s brutalist architecture constitutes a legacy which passes through generations. I can visit a church which my father knew and which my grandfather and great-grandfather knew as well. I can get some idea of how they lived and thought from the historic fabric which they left behind, including furniture, pictures, and archives. But this emotionally appealing sentimentality cuts no ice with the history is bunk brigade. They argue that structural cleansing is essential for prosperity, removing constraints to economic regeneration and growth at a time of unprecedented technological change, population increase, and competitive pressure. They argue that the UK's future depends upon new build, new airports, new railway lines, new hotels, new homes with optimal energy efficiency, new offices and factories capable of embracing new technologies. Their argument is that the root cause of the UK's poor productivity is a system of planning protection which prevents us from competing with the likes of Singapore, photographed here, or China in developing an infrastructure fit for the 21st century. The delays associated with nimbyism are a luxury we can ill afford. We need to get real 
stop hankering for an imaginary golden age of rustic tranquility and kick the Luddite promoters of nostalgic nonsense into touch. For them, the more tall buildings that are built in London, like the shard of glass, the better. They're energy efficient, they're beautiful, so they say. Never mind that they may blot out long stretches of the Thames from ever seeing the sun. More people will see the sun from within these great tall buildings. That's their argument. The Thames, in any event, should be turned into a channel of fresh water, covered up like so many of the old streams that used to run freely in London, in order to protect it from pollution and evaporation. It can then be built over, providing a super transport highway, exciting new cultural spaces and shopping centres, and of course, the mayor's great dream of a new airport at its eastern end. So I find myself giving this lecture with no really impressive academic qualifications to my name. There are a lot of people in this room who know a lot more about heritage than I do. I am a corporate finance advisor and a pretty amateur economist. I'm very suspicious of economic forecasts and of political predictions, mainly because they're so often wrong. I am also suspicious of what-if arguments. What if Bodicea's revolt had driven out the Romans? What if Britain had lost the First World War? Arguments, therefore, that protecting heritage impedes economic growth leave me deeply unconvinced. The facts suggest otherwise. Economic prosperity depends upon the production of goods and services that people domestically and around the world wish to buy. Some countries are blessed with capital assets which they can exploit, such as oil and other minerals and agricultural commodities or gas. But Britain has few capital assets of that nature. We've exhausted our coal, laid waste to our timber, and the oil is running out and may anyway belong to Scotland. Um, fracking is probably not going to be feasible. So what assets do we actually have? You know, ask around the world, and the answer which is most popular is our history, represented by our castles, and our historic houses, our churches, our old towns, and our stunning villages, and our remarkable ancient landscape is the reason given by most overseas visitors as to why they come here. It is also a leading reason for staying at home given by so-called staycationers, those who prefer to visit domestic attractions, that's English Heritage Trust's top attraction, and also the National Trust's attraction as well. Uh, so they prefer to go to domestic attractions instead of going <laughs> abroad. But it's not just about inward and homegrown tourism. A huge industry exists in this country to restore historic buildings and to adapt them for alternative use. And Heritage is a massive contributor to the building industry, representing a recognition by developers, large and small, that historic structures provide the fabric for places where people are happier to live, work and enjoy themselves. And the evidence for this can be seen across the country. Look at this, the granary at King, the King's Cross development, now an exciting restaurant and shopping area. And also there, also at King's Cross, just that building is going to be Jamie Oliver's cookery school. In Bristol, Brixton Market, Great Yarmouth, Regent Street, Liverpool. In West London, this great building now is an office for Tesco, I believe the Tesco head office, and Gateshead all great examples of regeneration and reuse. And it's generally accepted that the economic consequences of built and national heritage through inward and domestic terrorism together with construction amounts to approximately 2% of this country's GDP. It employs around three quarters of a million people and it engages at least, at least 500,000 volunteers. So that's the biggest contributor to the great big society. But there's also a further reason why heritage in the form of our historic environment is such an important capital asset for the UK. 
The great driver of our economy, as evidenced over the last five years, has come from the creative industries. The advance in GDP since 2010, including the increase in numbers employed by over two million people, has come from small and medium-sized enterprises, not major corporations, many of which, such as banks, have actually contracted. These businesses are typically involved with digital technologies, the arts, media, and other services. Their characteristics of flexible ways of working invariably involving the application of the most modern technology. Their hallmark is their creativity. And it's no surprise that many of these businesses have chosen to operate in old buildings adapted for their purposes. The Her Heritage Lottery Fund has recently published compelling research entitled New Ideas in Old Buildings, which supplies the statistical proof for this really important linkage of Britain's two great capital assets, our historic fabric and our creativity. You know, we don't have many assets. Those two assets are our key, key assets. And the dynamism of that linkage can be seen in London, of course, in places such as Shoreditch and Hoxton. But again, you can see it all over the country. Hartlepool, Margate. It's a driver, uh, it's real driver of regeneration in urban and rural areas. And it's able to transform those places so they can again bring sustainability and pride to their communities. Now, our heritage doesn't only bring powerful economic benefits. Beautiful surroundings contribute to a sense of well-being and happiness. 90% of respondents to a poll conducted by Heritage Counts, which is published by us, in areas where historic environment investment occurred, uh, agreed that it raised pride in their local area, increased sense of place, and encouraged places that promote social activities such as shopping and eating out. 87% of people agree that better quality buildings and public spaces can improve their quality of life. That's from a census report conducted by Ecclesiastical Insurance. And according to Taking Part, the National Survey of Culture, Leisure and Sport run by DCMS, 73% of adults had visited at least one heritage site over the course of 2013, and 69% of children aged between 5 and 15. In 2013, there were at least 58.6 million paid for visits to historic properties. Pa to make my words, paid for. That was in England. 58.6 million paid for visits to heritage properties in England. That's at least 15 million more than visits to all Premier and League football matches in the same period. And I'm excluding visits to natural heritage and also to free for entry sites, which would probably increase that number to about 300 million. Now, engagement with heritage, whether living nearby, visiting, or volunteering, and remember, at least 500,000 people volunteer in the heritage sector, that engagement induces a sense of well-being and satisfaction. And volunteering can be particularly helpful in restoring a sense of self-worth and comradeship to unemployed people, sick or disabled people, and former prisoners. One in three volunteers responding to a Heritage Lottery Fund survey in 2014 repeated, reported an increase in self-esteem and confidence in their abilities. The role of heritage in providing a foundation for developing a sense of community and local identity should not be underestimated. Over the last three years, Historic England has worked with 700 teachers in 200 primary schools in eight locations to train them in engaging their pupils in bringing local history to life. And that's focused in part on the First World War commemorations with pupils researching the names of the fallen on local war memorials and sharing the stories at local events. This program has touched over 100,000 pupils in some of the more deprived areas of England, like Great Yarmouth, Leicester, Bristol, North Tyneside. And it's increased the proportion of children with good knowledge of local history and heritage in these areas from 4% to 70%. I mean, it's the most fantastic 
act of engagement. Now, it's also really important to recognise that our heritage reflects the input of a vast and diverse range of contributors. Every citizen has a stake in this. It's a legacy inherited from our forebears, which we will manage and change and pass to successor generations. For example, Historic England's recent commissioned research on mosques shows an asset class little understood which forms an important component of our historic fabric. Many mosques and Buddhist temples originated in this country in the 19th century to accommodate citizens of the empire. That accelerated after partition of India in 1947, and it continues as Britain becomes a truly multiracial society. Now, we need to acknowledge the role and contribution of people from so many different ethnic groups in our national history. It is important that the multiplicity of cultures which have influenced our historic environment are understood, valued, and celebrated for their contribution to our national identity and DNA. Now, I want to talk about managing our historic heritage assets. Now, the principal custodians of the historic fabric of Britain are private owners. They own more historic buildings than any other category of owner. That's government, charity, company, or other mutual bodies such as religious institutions and housing associations. Much of this country's high quality landscape is maintained through the commitment of private owners. They may be subject to planning rules if their properties are listed, but there are few tax incentives for private owners of listed buildings, and grants are only occasionally available for heritage deemed at risk. There is evidence that listed buildings command a market premium, but that's not universal because of perceived regulatory constraints. But a combination of fashion and market incentive fortunately ensures that most private owners want to keep their historic assets in good order. And different operating and ownership models apply with the larger heritage assets of the UK. Some of these models are under considerable pressure, including some privately owned manor houses, a large number of churches, and buildings owned by central and local government. Models which appear to be in good health include various heritage charities, such as the National Trust and Historic Royal Palaces, and some of the major corporate property groups, such as the Crown Estate, Land Securities, and Grosvenor. Now, there are also the major high net worth investors, mainly from overseas, who have been buying significant properties in London and the home counties, some supposedly as trophy assets. But they've been buying them and returning them to the high standard of grandeur which they enjoyed when originally built. New wealth, however it may have been earned, has always had a crucial role in the construction and care of England's great country houses, parks and gardens. The likes of Roman Abramovich continue this tradition, as do some of the great property companies. Now, when I arrived at Historic England, which was then called English Heritage just under two years ago, my job was to help implement a demerger of its activities. And that involved basically splitting it in two and transferring the care of our collection of 400 properties, ranging from Stonehenge to Dover Castle to Apsley House just down the road and archaeological humps in the ground, transferring the care of those from an arm's length public body to a charity. And the reason for that was because management by a charity rather than government is actually a much more effective way to run those sort of properties. But it also uh, removed a potential conflict of interest between our role as regulator and our role of running properties. Uh, but it also gave a great, uh, greater sense of clarity to our purpose. So the demerger became effective earlier this year. Historic England adopted its new name and retains responsibility for advising on listing, planning applications, grant making, research 
and guidance. It also looks after a huge archive of about 12 million uh, documents and photographs. We continue to be funded mainly by government and remain the owner or guardian of our property collection. So this was not privatization, just privatization of management uh, in the charity. And the charity, which is called the English Heritage Trust, with exclusive use of the English Heritage name, has received £80 million from the government as a one-off contribution to resolve its considerable backlog of conservation work. And it's expected within seven years to have used the advantage of its freedom as a charity to reach financial break-even and thereby cease to be dependent on the public purse. Now, this is at the cutting edge of public service reform and a possible exemplar for other public bodies. We've embarked on this challenge from a position where, despite having over 800,000 members and charging for admission for 120 of our 420 sites, we still operate at a financial loss. So how is this charity going to reach break-even? Well, it will benefit from being free from the annual cycle of government budgeting, and it can play to the gallery with greater commercial freedom. It can plan long term. It will be a better place to attract philanthropic donations, particularly from such magnificent institutions as the Heritage Lottery Fund. Few philanthropists give money to government agencies. It can more readily appeal to volunteers. And it can circumvent the restricted nature of government procurement rules and wage controls. The charitable model, charitable model has a great advantage over the private or corporate operator. Charities are exempt from income tax and corporation tax. They benefit from gift aid. They also enjoy wide-ranging exemptions from VAT. Inheritance tax and its predecessor, estate duty, simply does not apply to them, which means that they can avoid massive capital sales at each generational changeover, which otherwise breaks up collections and supporting estates. Now, I'll come back to these tax advantages because they have a profound impact on the private ownership of larger heritage assets. The English Heritage Trust is following in the footsteps of the most successful independent heritage organization in the world, the National Trust, which was founded 120 years ago in 1895, now has over 4 million members and generates over £100 million each year from its own resources to spend on cyclical conservation and new capital projects at its properties. I'm delighted that both the most, re the most recent past Director General of the National Trust and the most recent past Chairman of the National Trust are here in the room, and they should take a lot of credit for the National Trust's success. Now, the National Trust is supported by over 60,000 volunteers it receives approximately £50 million each year in legacies. Historic Royal Palaces, which is operator of the Tower of London and Hampton Court, has vindicated the model that uh, English Heritage is now seeking to follow. Albeit it has a concentrated portfolio of just six properties centred mainly in the London area, with the biggest one, the most effective one, being the, the Tower of London. This charitable and social capital model doesn't always work. It requires critical mass in terms of a collection of properties. It also requires leadership, which balances the charitable purpose of access and education with hard-nosed financial realism. The National Trust came close to collapse after it purchased its first major country house, Barrington Court in Somerset in 1907. Oh, what have I done? in uh, Barrington Court in Somerset in 1907. It paid £11,500 for the house, but made no provision for the cost of repairs or for an endowment. It was so strung by the experience that it made no effort to acquire further major houses for 30 years, and it did so only after it had se secured some important tax concessions from the government, including the incentive for properties and endowments to be gifted to it in settlement of tax liabilities. The tax regime in Britain, particularly so-called death duties, has forced many great houses and estates to be broken up over the last century. 
the National Trust and to a much lesser extent English Heritage have provided a safety net for some magnificent places. But many great houses have been lost as highlighted in the exhibition in 1974, the destruction of the English country house. I'm delighted that Marcus Binney, who was one of the organizers of that exhibition, is here in the audience, a great hero of the heritage sector. Now, faced with the crippling cost of repair and maintenance and the refusal by the tax authorities to permit the offset of these costs against their income, either from their surrounding estate or other sources, many owners took the option of just gutting their houses and selling whatever could be removed. Fireplaces, roof tiles, door frames, a dream for an architectural conservation business. Literally hundreds of great architectural masterpieces were destroyed before the planning re regime and some re relaxation of the tax rules staunched the flow. Lord Lothian, who left Blickling Hall and its estate of 10,000 acres to the National Trust in 1940, had warned about this threat in 1934 when death duties were set at 50%. He wrote, most beautiful country manor houses and gardens are now under the sentence of death, and the axe which is destroying them is taxation, and especially that form of taxation known as death duties. Today, many private owners struggle to keep their historic properties going. While places like Chatsworth and Blenheim are able to benefit from their scale and visibility and also from an ability to navigate generational succession through the inheritance tax system, many smaller properties cannot make ends meet. They're not part of a portfolio. They have difficulty attracting volunteers. Their tax treatment has become increasingly burdensome, particularly with the removal of any exemption from the full rate of VAT being the most recent blow and they face nightmares of regulation which increase their costs. The smaller private owner is definitely again under threat with consequences which, whilst they won't lead to those buildings being pulled down, will lead to a change of use. The Historic Houses Association, which represents private owners of historic houses open to the public, believes that at least 70 of its members are in danger of closing their doors and trying to sell up. Each such closure is likely to cause jobs to be lost and upset the momentum of some closely knit communities, particularly in rural areas, as well as resulting in public access to these places probably being denied. The severance of the link between house and owner, along with public access, closes an important window upon a distinct category of our great historic mansions. Private owners, through living in their properties, bring them to life for visitors in a way which is much more difficult, if not impossible, for an institution. The National Trust has been acutely aware of the danger of institutionalizing its properties. Museum and mausoleum sound alike, wrote one of its former senior executives, Robin Fedden. The best curator of a house is normally the owner who knows and cherishes it. It has been a deliberate policy at the National Trust to encourage former owners to remain involved with their family properties. Visitor numbers and enjoyment ratings are markedly better when this happens in a constructive way. And you can have some fun. The Marquis of Anglesey, who gave Place Nuid in Anglesey to the Trust, but continued to live there, described his experience as like living in the howder of a white elephant which somebody else feeds. James Lees Milne advised the staff at Attingham, you should bear in mind that Attingham, which is a National Trust property, has always been a home as well as a repository of works of art. But on the gilt Neapolitan chairs, people sat, and on the inlaid marble tops left there as curators. The cu corporate model for the ownership and management of heritage sites is generally in good health. Large estates such as the Crown Estate, land securities and Grosvenor generally take a long-term approach to their property portfolios, seeking to preserve the historic fabric, most particularly important external and internal features, whilst adapting structures for a sustainable, financially viable use. Their efforts have resulted in spectacular examples of regeneration. The redevelopment 
of the King's Cross area by Argent has involved the conservation of redundant buildings associated with the railway and their adaptation as offices, shops and restaurants within an outstanding and inspiring landscape. A similar example of regeneration is now in progress around Battersea Power Station, with the great chimneys, which a succession of developers wanted to knock down, forming a central feature of a spectacular redevelopment. The Crown Estates' work in redeveloping the area in Piccadilly around the Café Royale is another case of successful adaptation and reuse. There are other examples of great projects in Manchester, Liverpool, Newcastle, Birmingham, Leeds, Bristol, Norwich, and many other towns and cities around the country. Increasing austerity has put pressure on funding for major heritage assets owned by central and local government. Some of these have been successfully transferred to management by charities, such as the Royal Naval Dockyard at Chatham and the Victoria Baths in Manchester. It is sensible to do this where a visitor attraction exists or can be created, which can provide a route for financial self-sufficiency. It's not so easy for city parks and gardens or buildings previously used as prisons, hospitals or courts. A critical requirement for the parks and gardens is to ensure continued access, preferably free of charge. The future for public buildings, perhaps involving conversion to hotels, restaurants or some other commercial use, inevitably means that access will be restricted. But they can be viable and they can survive. What is clear is that there are solutions which could be found for most heritage assets, provided a realistic and constructive approach is taken. The dynamism of models involving either a social and charitable purpose or commercial use is more effective than it has ever been. Private owners of heritage assets are, however, under pressure with those tax reliefs having been withdrawn and grant funding reduced. It's some, of, some of these places are going to have to close their doors over the next few years and find alternative solutions unless they're absorbed by perhaps one of the charitable organisations. The category of heritage asset which is truly facing a crisis are Christian places of worship, mainly operated by the Church of England. 4,500 of the Anglican Church's buildings are listed Grade 1. That's 45% of the total of Grade 1 buildings in England. There are a further 12,000 or so churches in the Church's care, most either Grade 2 star or Grade 2. Diminishing church attendance in rural areas, combined with accelerating costs of repair and the need for some modernisation to provide facilities such as heating and disability access, represent a massive burden. Possible solutions include adaptation for greater community use, maybe for teaching purposes or catering. But any such adaptation may challenge inviolable trust deeds or deeply held religious sensitivities. There's a huge, huge issue which requires the attention of all who care about our heritage and those involved in managing places of worship. The Chancellor's recent one-off grant of £55 million over two financial years for roof repairs certainly helps, but there needs to be a sustainable way ahead for buildings which, probably more even than our castles, constitute a timeless an enduring feature of the English landscape. I hope I have given you a sense of the resilience of what is often called the heritage sector. Basically, this lecture is mainly good news. I hope I've given you a sense of how the historic environment contributes to our sense of well-being, our sense of identity, that unifying force that Lord Clark described in 1970, and how it contributes to our national wealth and prosperity. I've no doubt that heritage is a force for good. And the force is with us. <laughs> There's increasing evidence of popular enthusiasm for history and our historic fabric. It's not just the popularity of television programs and the way that historians such as uh, David Starkey, Dan Snow and Bethany Hughes have become household names. It is evidenced in social media as people tweet <laughs> and blog about places that matter to them, many of which are historic but not listed. A recent poll that we conducted 
uh, of 5,000 respondents. This is by YouGov. Not everybody um, has, you know, get rates polled particularly highly these days. But this is a poll by YouGov, 5,000 respondents, and it showed that nearly 40% of respondents had done something over the last year to protect a historic site which they knew, writing to an MP or signing a petition or something else. This is a rising tide, absolute rising tide. People increasingly realize that our heritage is something that belongs to all of us, something inherited from our forebears and which we need to conserve responsibly and pass down in good order to our successors. The tide of barbarism which sees history as bunk or garbage remains a potent force internationally and at home. There remains a sense of shame about celebrating our history and our extraordinary legacy of historic structures. So I want you to stand up for heritage. It's extraordinary <laughs> that the word heritage or something similar, it's extraordinary that that word continues to be excluded from the nomenclature of government ever since the Department of Heritage disappeared in 1997. Heritage is the elephant in the room when the Department of Culture, Media and Sport seeks to justify why it exists. It is less dependent on handouts from government than the arts. England may win the World Cup once in a century, but our heritage is a winner for England every day of the year. <laughs> the heritage sector largely pays for itself in contrast to museums or the BBC, which rely heavily on state handouts or the bespoke television license fee. I'm not seeking to belittle any of those great cultural institutions, but surely there should be an H, H for heritage, in the title DCHMS. So please join me in promoting it. Thank you very much. <laughs>